Wisconsin Broadcasters Association Hall of Famer Bob Berry ruled Milwaukee's airwaves in the 60s and 70s. He spoke with countless musicians and celebrities over the years. Bob collected remarkable recordings of these encounters, which he's now sharing with the public. Here's Bob. Well, if you ever run into Dick Cavett, don't call him an intellectual. He'll explain, and he'll reprimand me for even suggesting that. Cavett was a popular TV talk show host. He interviewed all the big names of the time. Lucille Ball, Marlon Brando, George Harrison, Richard Burton, and hundreds more. He'll talk about some of his best and worst conversations. Cavett was also a writer for Jack Parr and came up with the famous line, Here they are, Jane Mansfield when introducing the well-endowed actress. Dick also wrote for Merv Griffin and Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. Clips from Cabot's TV show have been used in the films Annie Hall, Forrest Gump, and Apollo 13. You may have seen him on Saturday Night Live, Kate and Alley, and Cheers. Dick was on television in the United States for five decades. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cabot. This is Dick Cabot with Bob Barry. Hello. Hello, Dick. How are you? Good, how are you? Okay. Hey, you are one hell of a talent, and I am really happy to see that you're going to be back on television again with CBS. I am? That's well, it's what it says here. Uh, not God, not that I know of. Okay, well, what's coming up then? It's probably a uh, out-of-date press release. Well, <laughs> yeah, it kind of sounds like my program. You know what I can't understand is why uh, someone hasn't gotten smart by now and picked you up. You know, there, there are so many things that you could do. Uh, I, I just don't understand it. Or are you turning down a lot of things? Well, uh, this... That I'm in negotiation at the moment with something that I really can't talk a hell of a lot about, so uh, it's one of those things that may take a while. And meanwhile, what I'm doing is um, guesting on shows from time to time and just doing a lot of things that I never had time to do. Dick, you're really a daring questioner. Do you uh, prepare a lot uh, when you interview someone? Is there a lot of preparation involved, or are these a lot of... It depends on the person involved. Sometimes it's a mistake to prepare at all, because your own instincts would guide you into the better stuff than... Uh, what you'd read about them in current biography or whatever. So it just varies so from person to person. Sometimes I over-prepared, sometimes I under-prepared, and I never found the formula. Mm-hmm. If, if there's a secret, there's still a secret as far as I'm concerned. I don't know what it is. Is there a lot of tension involved in interviewing some of these people? Yeah, and it doesn't always show. That's one of the weird things about the medium I found, that you can do an interview in which either you or the guest or both is much more tense than appears on the air. The television camera can be fooled all over the place. And then the fact that there's an audience there, plus another audience looking, and that they aren't demanding the same things. By that, I mean the studio audience can pull you in one direction, and the home audience has a whole different set of requirements for watching a show. And it's hard to balance the two off sometimes. I know this is going to be a rough question, uh, because you've inter- interviewed a lot of heavy people. In fact, a lot of people that uh, none of the other hosts of talk shows could get to. Who would you say is the one that you enjoyed the most? Mm. I don't think I could declare a winner. There are just too uh-huh. many people I got that I never expected to get who were enjoyable. And people that I, I, I don't know, certainly the Hepburn shows were in a kind of class by themselves. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, right? It's hard to say they were better than, uh, you know, that I enjoyed that any more than I did with being with Groucho or Betty Davis or Olivier or Brando or whoever. I mean, each in its own way is enjoyable. It always seems like you've been kind of a quiet person, that uh, you didn't really enjoy being a celebrity. Is that true? It, that alternates with me. There are times when I enjoy it simply because it's uh, sort of uh, ludicrously amusing. Uh-huh. And all the other times I forget that people know my face, and I think, what is it that makes people keep bothering me? You, know, I just, you can't keep it in your mind the whole time. That You walk down the street and are lost in thought, and somebody says, hey, it's you. You, you yourself can be surprised and say, it's who or who. Do you, uh, do you go to a lot of movies? Keep no, I don't go to enough life? movies. I wish I could go to a couple movies a week. What was the last one you saw? Did That's you... entertainment part. I saw it last night at the premiere. You didn't see all the President's Men yet? Uh-huh. Yeah, I did. What oh, did you? Yeah. What did you think of it? That was the next to the last movie. I saw it. It was just a wonderful film. Yeah. I had some doubts about being able to turn that into a film that wouldn't be, oh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, just what they feared, kind of tedious and a story that was uh, a little too complicated to really be able to handle. It would sprawl all over the place. And people would have to bring a lot of specialized knowledge to it. And all. But to me, the movie was as good as any detective movie. It's are you real sensitive to press criticism? Uh, you got a lot of it there for a while. Uh, for a while? <laughs> it's still, <laughs> still on. <laughs> you mean it was one week and... Uh, no, I don't think so. I find that uh, something Brando said about how you develop a callus at the time is true. You just uh, And some perverse part of me finds it 
terribly funny that something I set out to do that was supposed to entertain didn't. When I was appearing in clubs, I would have that. I would I, the fact that an audience one night wasn't laughing, whereas they'd been laughing at the same step the night before. I mean, a different audience, of course, would strike me as so funny, and the spectacle of someone standing there and being silly enough to submit himself to this would make me laugh, and that would save the situation. You can't always. I mean, if, if criticism is stupid, un, unenlightened, unfair. Dick Cavett is on the air with us this morning, and is there anyone that you'd like to interview sometime uh, on a television program who uh, maybe has refused you or you haven't asked yet? Well, it'd be nice. Sinatra, I've always, this is something that I've always wanted to do because I met Sinatra at a weekend party once and found him so much more interesting, I guess, than I'd expected him to be. I don't know why I expected him to be uninteresting, but, and uh, the funny thing is that I got most of the people that I really had had my goal, you know, my heart set on, so to speak, people they told me you couldn't get. I always wanted to do Orson Welles, but I never thought it would be possible. And at that point, I don't think he'd ever done anything like that. And I did three full shows with him. Who else had sounds uh, so satisfied to say that there are, there are others, of course. Uh, Terry Grant, who was at this thing last night, I suddenly realized, too, how nice it would have been to sit and listen to him reminisce for a while. Yeah, Terry Grant won't. Uh, Terry, we've tried Terry Grant, too. He just uh, stays away from it. You are a super uh, intellectual, uh, Dick, and uh, can you think of any of the guests that you've had on who are informative to you? Well, I think I'm not an intellectual. And this is a label that has been hung on me for so long that um, I gagging from it. Um, I, I would Sorry. think that anyone who thinks I'm an intellectual doesn't know one when he sees one. <laughs> okay. That's, I think I got that reputation from uh, the fact that I, critics began to notice that I had read the guest books, which I did out of not knowing any better when I was first doing talk shows, and the fact that I, I, mean, I, I don't, I, I, I truly am not an intellectual. I may be more intelligent than um, some people, but I don't know how much. Whatever happened with that Polish joke thing that was Steve Allen? The, the Polish guy wanted uh, equal time? I don't know. I think that is still going on, and people think that uh, that was when you're referring to an incident where somebody, when I was off the show for a week on vacation, Steve Allen hosted, and they did a Polish joke sketch. Right. And there was a big reaction to it, and people were furious, and I still get nasty mail from people who say, I was it, I did it, and they even go into detail remembering the smirk on my face as I did it. I was not <laughs> even in the country at the time. So. You ever find yourself sexually attracted to some of your female de- guests? Yes, for years afterwards. Care to mention any? Um, no, probably not, because some of them are old and decrepit now. <laughs> how, how are the guests uh, selected for a, a show like yours? Producer usually did it. I, I, I didn't uh, get into that too much, because although he knew who I might want and not want, I found it much better to turn that completely over to someone else. I mean, just the day-to-day, when I was doing five days a week, the day-to-day thing of filling up three or four guests per show, um, I couldn't make all the decisions that had to be made, because I'd get involved in an endless balancing act and realize you can't do it that way. The special guests, of course, were people, in many cases, that I just went after personally or told them to try to get the, you know, the one-man show, one-woman show shows. Yeah, I was wondering about your personal friends, if uh, you could, you know, get them on. You mean uh, personal friends from private life or? Uh, yeah, uh, private life, if uh, maybe they're a celebrity of, you know, some sort that uh, you've known over the years and you wanted them on, was it possible to, uh, to get them on then? In some cases, it's a disadvantage. Uh, Woody Allen was a personal friend uh, when I was doing first doing a show, and he'd come on whenever somebody fell out and saved me a few times. Um, but sometimes if you know someone really well, it's harder to talk to them on the air than it would be to a stranger. Okay. What was that, Dick? Uh, that was a cockatoo. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you, you have kind of a zoo there, huh? The one from Citizen Kane, I think. <laughs> about that. Oh, that's, uh, that's funny. Uh, did the network censor uh, much of your material? Yes, you can see my book for details on this, which will stand your hair on end. But what is not, you know, in the main percentage, it was small, but the times they chose were really irritating. And I never, ever understood how it worked. It was just never seemed to be the same twice. Never knew what principles they were using. Never knew what they were talking about when they present their arguments for why they were doing this and that. Ground shifted constantly. Were you ever bored uh, doing your shows? Yeah, frequently. There are times when after you've done three or four in a row, uh, you get kind of numb to the rhythm of it somehow. And you know, I've talked to other talk show hosts, all of them, so sometimes I just I realize I'm looking into a guest's face and I don't know what he's talking about or what he's been talking about for the last five minutes. Some kind of automatic pilot takes over for you at times like that, apparently, unless you happen to be so unfortunate as to just plane fall asleep. I don't think that's happened. <laughs> oh, you know, that to me. There were usually some wild things happening there, like Lester Maddox walking on in or something like that. Huh? That was uh, a 
run an unusual evening, yeah. I mean, that, you can't count on that happening very often, but uh, that was dynamite because it happened between tape and air, I think it was on all of the news shows that Maddox had done that, so people saw that show who had never seen a late-night talk show. Everywhere I go still, people recall it. I can't remember the reason now uh, why he walked out. I know, uh, I guess... He ended at um, something I had said, which was a translation, or I was a rewording of something I guess had said just before we went to commercial, and he said that my rewording of it made it sound like all of his supporters were bigots, whereas what I had said was that among people who voted for you, there was a certain bigotry or something in some of the voters because of his stand on this net. He has a quick temper. I apologize in a minute, and I didn't see any reason to apologize. Yeah, he has a quick temper. He hung up on me one time. Oh, well, he's, maybe he was still trying to get some mileage out of his walk-off. That's his radio version of walking off. Yeah, he, that was when... On the uh, air with him at the time? Yeah, yeah. Muhammad Ali was in town uh, with uh, one of his fights, and uh, uh, I had mentioned that uh, he wasn't given a very good reception, and uh, he said, oh, that was the mayor that did that, and uh, I said, well, I heard that it was uh, you that uh, you know was responsible Responsible that you didn't want him yes, to Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, Maddox had said he'll never fight in this town or something. Right. He claimed he didn't say that and hung up on me. Are there, were there days that you were uh, simply in a bad mood? I asked that because there are times when, uh, you know, I do this program Monday through Friday from 6 to 10, and uh, there are days when I'm in a bad mood, but uh, you got to keep right on going. Yeah, I don't I know what you, It's just I suppose everybody's job has that, except that in something like radio or television, you're out there having to look like you're having a good time and do it for more people than if a bank clerk feels like he's having a bad day. In that sense, they're luckier than we are. Yeah, right. What qualities of yours do you try hardest to uh, repress on the air? Oh, let's see. Um, well, maybe going for a laugh when it wasn't necessary. problem of having a studio audience I talked about earlier. Being unnecessarily uh, quick to get angry, which is a thing I have in private life. I used to find guests make me mad sometimes. And I, and, uh, at times, I would, would doubt if I was reacting as myself or as a performer uh, giving a performance. Uh, and you just find you have to put that out of your mind and let whatever reaction comes be the one you use. Try to listen. Try to follow the ball. See what's going on. It's not so easy. Yeah. Dick, I want to thank you very much for taking time out from a, a busy day and uh, okay. talking to us on the air. Listen, have a good day. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bob Berry, W-O-K-Y, Thank you for listening to Bob Berry's Unearthed Interviews. Be sure to subscribe and rate our podcast on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find all the episodes at wisconsinbroadcastingmuseum.org. Check out Bob Berry's book, Rock and Roll Radio Milwaukee. Book sale proceeds support Angels Kids Fund and Donate Life Wisconsin. The preceding program was made possible by a generous contribution from Terry Bond.